<laughs> All right. If you'll turn with me to Philippians chapter 1 together, we'll be reading this morning. We'll be reading from verses 19 down to 26. <clears throat> passage for this morning is uh, verses 24 to 27. So, yeah, so we'll be reading from 19 to the end. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is to my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me is to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to, to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better." But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your accounts. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Only let your manner, be wor manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign for them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. In 2014, a really quite remarkable event happened. I'm sure quite a few remarkable events happened in 2014, but the event which I am speaking of occurred when a church that had a membership of 7,000 members and a weekly attendance of 13,000 attendees ceased to exist entirely in one day. It was not taken up in the rapture. It was not swallowed up like Korah and those who led his rebellion, uh, led, he led into rebellion against Moses with him, uh, was swallowed up by the earth. They uh, did not get suddenly convicted of some secret heresy. There was no great trial of of uh, sexual misconduct amidst the leadership as has often happened in large churches or small. In fact, this was a church where every Sunday the true gospel of Christ was preached quite powerfully, where men, women, and children were called out of lives of sin, gave their lives to Christ in truth, were baptized into the church, and participated faithfully in pursuing Christ and holiness together. This was a remarkable event that a church of 7,000 such people that drew such crowds to itself suddenly vanished, not according to some great tragedy of persecution or any other thing, but what happened was that the pastor, the lead pastor of that church, 7,000 people with 20 other under pastors, which is a thing of itself, and, uh, and many more elders in it, 
that pastor was accused of poor leadership and of a, an abusive temper. And he stepped down from the ministry rather than facing that uh, trial and rebuke. And the next Sunday after he stepped down, another megachurch pastor showed up, gave a sermon telling everybody that uh, God had done great things in their midst, God's peace, and they shut the doors and the church ceased to exist. This is a remarkable thing, just about unheard of in the history of the church. There certainly have been churches which have disappeared for various reasons, because there has been great sin, because dynamics of the environment simply changed and uh, the young people moved on and those who were there slowly died out or move their membership to another church. I mean, we can look at Waterville here as an example of a church that really just kind of faded away quietly over time, um, not because God's presence was removed from the area, but people moved to other churches or whatever. Um, there are places where the church uh, has abruptly shut its doors because of uh, very severe accusations of misdeeds and misconduct that has compromised the entire trust in the leadership and the uh, the purpose of that church. But if you were to look at Metropolitan Tabernacle where Spurgeon preached in London, England, though it has diminished from the 6,000 who used to meet to hear him, you can still go there today and you can listen to Peter Masters preach and you can sit in the meager congregation of a thousand people in 1500 at Sunday school compared to the, the crowds gathered by Spurgeon. And though diminished, it is still a mighty testimony of the light of the gospel in the world. There are many churches that have sprung up and grown great surrounding great teachers of the gospel men who are powerful in their teaching of the word that did not abruptly cease to exist when that teacher departed from them. If you go to Bedford, there's still a church in Bedford. <laughs> there's a church in Bedford that still has the records of John Gifford, who is Bunyan's pastor, and of John Bunyan. And there is a, a history that has followed through from those men until present day where God's church has persisted various times in strength at various times in weakness and nevertheless the gospel has carried on so what in the world could have transpired that would have allowed a church to just suddenly shut its doors and turn itself off because the pastor left this is a tremendously strange thing and yet it's something that we need to understand because it speaks to a fundamental error that has crept into the church and what it understands itself to be. And we are not immune to such errors. We are very capable of falling into these errors ourselves. So if we want to understand what took place in the church that I'm describing, well, certainly not every member of that church proved to be a false convert fact, the vast majority continued on in the faith. Uh, in the aftermath of that church closing its doors, 25 other churches sprang up, and uh, we pray uh, that they continued to be led in the true gospel, and uh, perhaps better led than they were before, and perhaps there's an error in the, the whole system that would allow 13,000 people to be gathering under one minister without seating other churches. Uh, certainly we can evaluate the wisdom of that, but the fundamental problem that allowed that church to totally disincorporate itself and, and dissolve itself as an entity was that it misunderstood a fundamental question, 
And that question is, whose church is this? Whose church is this? Now I ask you to think about that right now, right here, we sit in sovereign grace in Haneytown, New Brunswick. Whose church is this? I will tell you one thing, it's not my church. It's not Perry Edwards' church. Though John MacArthur is a well-known pastor, John MacArthur's church is not John MacArthur's church. And John Piper's church is not John Piper's church. And Steve Lawson's church is not Steve Lawson's church. And there is a fundamental error when people talk about the church in such a way that the church is not the property of its pastor. <laughs> I do not own this church. I belong to this church. I am a member of the body of this church whose head is not Neil Whitman. Now, if you think, as frankly many churches do, that you're right, the church does not belong to the pastor. What vile heresy. The church belongs to us. We own the church. Yes, yeah, that's right. The body owns the church. The pastor is its employee to serve at their pleasure. No, that is vile and unbiblical. Perhaps the right understanding, many would say, is that we together own the church and the church belongs to us, that we may serve one another by belonging to this church. And that too is utter unbiblical filth. It is actually heresy. Not to say that a one who expresses it or has been tricked into believing it is themselves a heretic, but to call the church of Christ something that is owned by any man or any group of men, <laughs> a thing to be controlled by men is utter heresy. The church is the body of Christ who is its head. The church is the bride of Christ who is its husband and master and Lord and King. This church does not belong to me. It does not belong to you. And it does not belong to us. It belongs to Jesus Christ and him alone. And the fundamental error that allowed a church to just shut itself off because its pastor left was that they did not appreciate that they had no authority to shut the church down. It wasn't their church. They did not own it. They did not have the authority to shut it down. It is Christ's church. It is impossible for me to believe that that body of believers did not have in the 20-some pastors or the 70-some elders or in the larger bodies someone who could have stood up and served that body and a number of men as elders in the absence of that one man who left. It is impossible for me to believe that. Should they have no doubt, certainly done what they ought to have done in the first place and taken those campuses that were off-site and turned them into church plants under local pastoral leadership? Absolutely. And they would have in that immediately founded 14 separate churches and been a church of one or 2,000 instead of 
7,000 members. And yet it could have persisted if they had only recognized that they lacked utterly the authority to turn it off. It was not their church to do so. And we need to understand something, that we belong to the church and the church belongs to Christ. This fundamental understanding is necessary for us to be even able to begin to walk in faith together according to what the scripture gives us. Now you may find this to be somewhat strange and irrelevant to what we're talking about, but I, uh, I will show you why I'm talking about this. Because Paul here has spoken to the Philippians and he has given them three specific commands. The three specific commands he has given to them are to conduct themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel, to have unmovable unity from the Spirit, and to have or engage in harmonious combat for the faith. Conduct worthy of the gospel on movable unity from the Spirit and harmonious combat for the faith. That last might sound strange, but you'll get it, I pray, when we get there. Now I want you, before we even start, to consider the three points that I've just said. I didn't just make these up. These are really just paraphrases of what he told them here in verse 27. Only let your manner be sorry, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. First point. Let your manner of life be worthy, or your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So that whether I come and see you or in absence, I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit. How are you to stand firm? In one spirit. That is unmovable unity, standing firm in one spirit. With one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. So you are striving together, side by side, that is combating in unison together harmoniously for what? For the faith. Which one of these things did Paul command them to do for him? Not a single one, right? Which one of these things did he command them to do even for each other? <laughs> not, not one, right? And I'll explain this, but I, I want us to just understand something here, that if we understand rightly our relationship to the church, it will empower us to live rightly in relationship to God and to one another. But if we misunderstand this point, we will be in danger of falling into uselessness and ultimately to failure in such a degree as brings shame to the name of Christ. The church that I spoke of ultimately founded itself on the principles that we agree with, the doctrines of grace, on the true salvific work of Christ alone and faith alone, the authority of Scripture alone. They preached that faithfully week after week, and their their lead pastor powerfully and effectively communicated those truths to the salvation of many. And yet, they began with a subtle problem. That problem was that there was a, a wrong focus on certain doctrines, a wrong focus in particular on male headship as a corrective to the abuses of the world that created a, a picture of the family that was not exactly right. And that twisted in some degree over the years 
the view of leadership itself until what started well as a church founded with a multiplicity of elders in communion with one another in submission to the body ultimately ended up with the pastor as Pope. Quite literally, he referred to himself as the father of all of these people. Pope, by the way, is Papas. It means father. He was their father. They were his children. He was directly responsible to care for them. They gave their lives to Christ, entered his church, and now they were his family and he their father. And there is a sense in which, yes, a, a pastor ought to be like a spiritual father and there is a sense in which that is utterly untrue and you have one father and he is in heaven and if we break the structure of the church and assign it as being the ownership of a wrong thing and our service given to a wrong thing then we will fail in our christian walk and so paul gives us these three points that we are to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, that we are to be unmovable in our unity from the spirits, that we are to be harmonious in our combat for the faith. Three things and not one of them a man. So conduct worthy of the gospel. Notes that Paul tells them to do this after having said that he needs, or it is needful for them, that he come and be with them in order to build them up in the joy and the faith that they have. Paul, in his previous passage, uh, immediately prior to this, which we looked at last week, has expressed very clearly that his decision to pursue life, and not to simply, as, as Ignatius did in his own wisdom, according to what he believed God had called him to, allowed himself to be brought without contesting the charges, Paul did all that was in his power in order to escape the verdict of death, in order that he might continue to serve the church. And he says that his reason for doing so, right here in verse 24, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your accounts. Now, in reading that, it might be possible for us to draw the wrong conclusion that what Paul means is to say that it is necessary for the Philippians that he live and come to them, or they will not be able to have progress in joy and in faith, and that somehow their progress in the faith is dependent upon his presence. But if you read it that way, then you are not reading carefully because in the very next passage right here in verse 27, he says that whether or not he is present, they must do these things. That whether or not he is present, they are called to do these things and they are to do them for and by means that are not himself. Right? And so what does Paul mean when he says it is needful for them he means that in relation to his own desire to depart and be with God, he recognizes that it is needful for him to serve them. And just as I said, I am not your commander, I am your fellow servant, Paul recognized that even as an apostle, he was not the commander of the Philippian church, but he was called to be their servant. Just as it says in Ephesians 4, by Paul's hand as well, 11 to 12. And he, that is God, gave some as apostles, some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. God gave Paul to the church. God <laughs> gave Neil, either his blessing or judgment, to the church in order that Neil might serve that church, in order to equip them and build them up in the body of Christ. He did not give the church to Neil. And so it is needful for me as your pastor to be constantly mindful 
that the conduct that is worthy of the gospel of Christ in me is the same conduct that is worthy of the gospel of Christ in Paul when he recognizes that he ought to do all things in his power to the service of the church, even though it is not what he wants to do. And he will sacrificially live out for the sake of the church when he is tired, weary, and ready to go home because he knows that that is what is required of him to be honorable towards the Christ who died for his own sake. That is his living out his life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. It is an example of it. It is not in any sense a statement that it is necessary for the church that he himself be present. And he makes that quite clear. So what does it mean then in order to be conducting yourself in a manner that is worthy of the gospel of Christ? Whether or not I am present, Paul is present, John Piper is present, or whomever you want to choose is your precious figurehead in the world. <laughs> well, one thing Paul says here, which explains much if you really consider what he means by it, is that he says that they are to stand, they are to conduct themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit and striving together for the faith. That whether or not I'm present, I will hear that you are doing it well. Well, does he mean to convey to the Philippian church that they ought to be doing this because if they don't, he's going to hear of it and drop the hammer? I don't think that's what Paul means to say at all. He's actually telling them who have been his faithful companions and servants themselves that he longs for them to live their lives in a manner worthy of the gospel because they ought to know that he will hear of it for good or for ill, how they have conducted themselves. And their conduct is not in any way isolated to themselves, but has an impact on the entire church, even up to the Apostle Paul and his ability to stand firm in the gospel where he is and to be a proclaimant of the gospel who is heard where he is, in the presence of Caesar's household imprisoned at Rome. Consider the events of last week in Ukraine. Consider the town of Buka, where I believe the report I saw was 318 civilian dead were recorded as being on the streets, many with hands tied behind their backs, and apparently executed. Now, Russia says they didn't do it. Ukraine says, yes, you did. Germany says, well, I actually have some radio chatter of people who are describing things that sound like they might be that. I'm not here to discuss the plausibility of any of these assertions. <laughs> Men in combat do vile things often when they let themselves and their passions go astray. What I want you to consider is what is the effect upon the efforts of the nation of Russia by the events which are recorded to have happened in Buka where 318 men, among them the dean of the evangelical seminary, were killed, apparently by execution, probably by Russian soldiers. What is the effect of that? I tell you one thing, it's a lot bigger than the 300 people who are dead. The consequences of that have been vast and severe for the entire nation of Russia. 
Russia had a very, very important task for its troops going in. Minimize civilian casualties. That was the, the command of the Russian military objective. That was the command of Putin to his army. Don't let us look like the bad guys. Not because of some sort of compassion that they had for human life, but because of their recognition of the importance of not appearing to be more brutal than they must, they have actually done remarkably well at keeping civilian casualties quite low. And notwithstanding what you hear in the news, they probably have done better than we did in Afghanistan, Iraq, and certainly Libya and Syria in our interventions into those regions. Nevertheless, some Russian soldiers seemingly decided to get their own back and to kill innocent civilians who were helpless to protect themselves in what are war crimes. And guess what the result of that is? Russians are now war criminals. <laughs> Putin is now <clears throat> firmly acknowledged, though he himself, I just about guarantee you, did not order that <laughs> and specifically wanted that never to happen for the sake of his own credibility, is now a war criminal. And the whole effort of Russia to try and seize this country with minimal loss is entirely circumvented because all these NATO countries are now even more flooding their weapons into Ukrainian hands in order to defeat Ukrainian soldiers' weapons and equipment. Those Russian soldiers in their poor conduct have caused more harm to the nation of Russia than they ever could have accomplished good by simply being faithful to what they ought to have done. And that's just the bare truth of it. We have that concept that we talked about in our own armies in NATO in the Afghanistan conflict of the strategic corporal. Every single corporal, though he may not have the power to win the war, has the power to lose it. <laughs> that is the principle. Every single corporal, should he do the right, wrong thing, and it be publicized, has the ability to absolutely undermine the entirety of the effort, just as when in Somalia the United Nations forces were there in order to keep peace between warring factions, two Canadian soldiers thought they would teach a kid who was stealing a lesson, beat him, he ended up dying, and he undermined the credibility of the mission of the United Nations worldwide, of the Canadian Armed Forces in Canada for decades. And fundamentally debilitated the ability of Canada and to some degree even the United Nations to intervene for the sake of peace anywhere in the world. Two dudes did that by their wicked act. And they even felt justified in doing it, by the way, those two Canadian soldiers. They thought to themselves, and I believe this, because I've been in such places, if we hand him to the police, they'll beat him to death. If we do nothing, they'll continue to steal and we can't afford that. Let's just give him a trouncin so that he knows not to come back and tells others. And in the course of doing what they did, pragmatism, they killed a young boy and the consequences were severe, not just for themselves, but to their nation and to the world. This is what it means when Paul says to the Philippian church, let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, knowing that whether or not I am present with you, I will hear of it. <laughs> I will hear of it so that I may be encouraged and bolstered in my own strength, or I will hear of it so that I may be discouraged and that the name of Christ may be less powerful when I give it because of your poor example. Our conduct is not for each other, 
You do not conduct yourselves according to the gospel of Christ in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ for Neil. It is for the gospel of Christ. Your conduct ought to be according to the virtue of the one who sent the orders, not according to the virtue of the one who is passing the orders along. (laughs) If I happen to be a poor commander, it's because I'm not a commander. I am a leader under Christ to present to you the things which Christ has given to me that you might obey him, not me, and that you might be obedient to his orders and his intent and not even necessarily my interpretation of that intent or my direct application of it. We are called to serve the gospel And if anything at any point I say to you is is against that gospel of Christ, then you're to call me on that. And you're to say, hold on there, pastor. I don't think that's what the orders say. Pretty sure the mission was. (laughs) Maybe you've got it wrong a little bit in your execution here. Now, what does it mean to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ? Well, (laughs) it means this, right? Read it, understand what it calls you to. Ultimately, it's summed up in the two great laws, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, to love your neighbor as yourself. It means to flee from evil, to put to death the deeds of the flesh, to pursue holiness and all that is perfect, to discern what is excellent, as Paul says later on in this same letter. But if you want a very simple answer, and it is a simple answer that doesn't cover the breadth of all of the wisdom of Scripture, but we haven't time for that this morning, it's this, recognize that we are at war. We are not at war with the world's, We are at war with the powers of darkness of this present age, the spiritual forces that seek to bring shame to the name of Christ. Those Russian soldiers, which we can praise God and thank God, that we are not in their position of serving Russia in the midst of what's going on. It's a very difficult spot, I think, for a Christian to find themselves in, just as it was for the German in the Second War just it was, frankly, for the Canadian or American in some of our own recent wars. Hard things. We are not subject to a less than holy king who has questionable motives in the execution of our duties. We are subject to the king of kings, the lord of lords, the eternal, unchangeable, holy God in heaven, We are subject to him and members of that nation, soldiers who are in combat against the powers of darkness. But I will tell you that one thing that might guide us in our conduct is to consider what it is that our enemy does not want us to do. Think about that event in Ukraine And understand that though the Ukrainian government surely didn't want 300 of their citizens to die, (laughs) they nevertheless uh, were quite delighted to share to the world this event that undermined their enemy and brought credibility and support to themselves. I guarantee you that there were things that the Russians did in that same town that individual soldiers did that were acts of mercy, charity, love, kindness, and self-sacrifice. And I guarantee you that Ukraine does not intend to publish any such events for anybody's notice, certainly not those of their own citizens, should they know of them, right? Because that is contrary to what might inspire people to stand against their enemy. Well, in the same vein, Our enemy, Satan, and all of his spiritual powers want 
the name of Christ to be reviled in the world. They want the name of Christ to be made mockery of in the presence of the enemies of God. And anything which we do, if we consider what we are about to do and say, would Satan want the world to know that I'm about to do this? That's a pretty good litmus test for whether or not your conduct is worthy of the gospel of Christ. If it is the kind of thing which Satan would quite like the world to know that you're doing because it casts Christ as a liar, Christians as hypocrites, Christ's love as hate, there's a pretty good chance that you are not conducting yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. If, however, you think about it and Satan would wa not want your neighbor to be aware of what you are doing, lest it bring credibility to the name of Christ, it's a pretty good chance you ought to be doing that thing. Take that test when you are making a decision and you don't know if you should be doing something. Take that test and just consider how would the enemy like me to be doing this thing? And conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ who died in order that we might live. We're also called to unmovable unity from the Spirit. That is the second thing that we are called to stand firm in one Spirit. Now, it's not the Spirit of Neil. It's not the spirit of any one of you. It is the spirit of Christ which he is speaking of that gives us the unity. Ephesians 4, 1-4 says, Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness and patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were also called in the hope of your calling. We are to preserve the unity of God's spirit, and in this body of Christ there is one spirit, and it is Christ's spirit, God the Father's Holy Spirit. And it is that spirit that gives us unity, and in that spirit which we must stand firm together. Now there are those who would readily state and even eagerly state that it is not only right but necessary for Christians to cut off all fellowship with those who disagree with them on any point of theology, doctrine, or practice. There is this practice called fencing the table. And I, myself, if you have not have been to those places where I have been denied the participation in the remembrance of Christ's death and resurrection, in the participation in the body and blood of Christ, in the symbols of the bread and the wine, because I did not hold to every point of doctrine and practice. Away with you, heretic, no Lord's Supper for you who denies the certain fact of premillennial eschatology. <laughs> Been there. As strange as that is, to my mind and I hope to yours. We are called to stand firm in one spirit. And the spirit is not the spirit of a man's teaching. It is the spirit of the renewal of life that occurs in the hearts of those who have received the Holy Spirit according to their true repentance and their true faith in the Son of God, who is both God and man, who is one of the persons of the Trinity, who is the God and creator of all creation, and by whom they receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and become made one. As we read when we went into Isaiah 61, they are married to the presence of God who are washed in the new covenant in Christ's blood. Married in union, in one flesh, with the presence of God. And if you attack 
your brother in Christ or your sister in Christ, you are literally attacking God himself. Because they are one flesh with God. It is a non-trivial thing to attack your fellow brother or sister in Christ Jesus. It is a vile thing worthy not of the gospel of Christ. Let us flee from such a thing lest we be caught in it and be worthy of the fires of hell for calling our brother in the Lord a fool and condemning him to hell in our own judgment who Christ died for. It is unacceptable. John Gifford, in his final letter to the church at Bedford, John Gifford, who led Bunyan and established him in the faith, in his final letter after his retirement, said to them, concerning separation from the church, about baptism, laying on of hands, anointing with oil, psalms, or any other externals, I charge every one of you respectively as you will give account of it to our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge both the quick and the dead at his coming, that not one of you be found guilty of this great evil, which whiles some have committed, and that through a zeal for God, yet not according to knowledge, they have erred from the law of the love of Jesus Christ, and have made a division within the true church, which is but one." They have torn it. They've torn the church, which is but one church, over these matters. I wish you to know this morning that it is my firm conviction that should you disagree with me on any point of practice of the faith, should you disagree with the firm convictions of this church on matters of doctrine and practice, though we may differ in our opinions or our, our understanding of what Scripture commands us in those matters, we are brothers and sisters in Christ if you have trusted yourself to God and received his Holy Spirit. There is no division between us. Though you may not be willing or able in good conscience to submit entirely to the eldership and the teaching and convictions of this church on one practice or another. We are not enemies. We stand in the one true faith as brothers and sisters in Christ, though we disagree with one another on tactics. Let us not turn our swords against one another. I, for my part, and the elders with me, will not impose upon you anything which is contrary to your conscience. And you, for your part, will not be divisive in turning yourself against the teaching of the church in such a way as would bring division and tearing in the body of Christ. And we shall turn our swords towards our common enemy and fight it together, standing firm in the unity that we have in the Spirit, and in the time between trading strokes with Satan, the world, and the passions of our own flesh, we can talk tactics together about the best way to satisfy what God has given to us. But let us never be enemies who are bound together in the same body of Christ. That church that I described at the beginning to return to it, It fell to the waywardness of being unified under the doctrine of a man instead of under the binding work of the renewal of the hearts of men in the Holy Spirit. It fell to the prey of being careful in doctrine, although I think incautious in some significant ways. They were careful to insist upon every practice, every interpretation that they held to. A man who belonged to that church was immediately told that his wife must not work outside of the home, for that is how they understood it to be 
best expression. Th that is what they understood to be the best expression of male headship and female submissiveness. They actually would not allow a man to have any role in any ministry of the church if his wife had any job outside of the home. It's a strange conclusion to me to come to if I read Proverbs 31 and acknowledge that the perfect wife is employed in selling and buying outside of her home, for her home, but nevertheless, they held that as their conviction. They also added to the gospel and the unity of the spirit as a necessity for being part of that body, one must read a several hundred page book on doctrine. And when challenged on it, the pastor said, I don't care, frankly. If somebody is unwilling to read a couple of hundred pages on doctrine, I don't really want them in my church. <laughs> Which apparently means that the illiterate were unwelcome. In order to become a member, it was necessary to sign on as having an agreement with the doctrines of the church, which were presented as 12 one-hour lectures. And you had to be in agreement <laughs> with all the things said in 12 hours of teaching on the doctrines of the church. And 7,000 people had signed up and said, yes, I've done all that. I guarantee they hadn't all. But nevertheless, they accepted all of those teachings as necessary for fellowship. That is fundamentally what started their problem. We are not bound together according to any man's teaching. You are not here unified under my teaching. You are not here unified under Calvin's teaching. You are not here unified under the councils that established the orthodox doctrines of the faith which we agree with in the first early periods of the church. We are here gathered together in fellowship that is bound together in the unity of the Spirit's renewing work in the hearts of those who have truly believed. That's it. That's all. Though we hold to the reformed doctrines of faith here, if you think that that is an easy thing to hold to and understand, <clears throat> great article for you. I, I recommend you look it up. Keith Matheson on important contexts for understanding Reformed theology, in which he details all of the things Reformed theology was written to combat, which if you don't understand will lead you to fundamentally misunderstand even what they were saying, let alone what they did not say and why they did not say it, and what they may have missed and what they said. Because nothing given by man gives us a right to unify under that banner. It is only under the Spirit of God that we may be unified. And in the Spirit of God, we can stand firm against the enemy. In no other thing will we be able to stand firm against the enemy. The third thing is our harmonious combat for the faith. Funny term, harmonious combat maybe. But it's actually what the Greek is referring to here, is that you are, <laughs> you are actually fighting or wrestling together as one person against something for the gospel. The something is unsaid, but it's the everything, is it not? We are to fight together against the enemies of that gospel. What are the enemies of that gospel? It's enumerated clearly in this epistle, and of course, more fully and clearly in the whole council of Scripture, we are wrestling together against the deeds of the flesh, the passions that remain in our flesh. We are wrestling together against the enemies of God in order that they might be saved, the enemies of God to whose ranks we once belonged, the false teachers in the world who would seek to bring a gospel of salvation by works of the law and not by faith the false teachers of the gospel who would present a different God as Savior, and of course, against Satan and all the powers that would seek to divide and bring destruction to the church and mockery to the name of Christ. It is these things that we are called to fight together as one person in one mind for not each other, 
for not some great guy like what if MacArthur were watching, but for the gospel, for the name of Christ, for the one who died for us, we will fight and we will stand against that. If indeed we stand as brothers in Christ, then we must not attack each other. We must perhaps attack the parasites that still cling to one another, just as soldiers who've dragged themselves through the jungle might inspect one another for ticks and leeches and drag them off, so must we regard one another carefully for those remaining passions of the flesh, lest they should destroy one another, we should carefully cut them off of each other with gentleness and love, bringing correction, rebuking with gentleness, with harshness if absolutely necessary, but then too only out of love to draw one back from the brink of destruction. But never are we to attack one another. We are to fight in unity. I want to tell you something. We have a church in our fellowship which tore itself in half because of convictions on something as non-biblical as whether or not the church should be open during COVID restrictions, whether or not COVID should be taken seriously, tore itself in half. And, and I'm dealing with that as a board member of that fellowship. And it's not fun, it's not pretty. Everybody is hurt. Everybody is wounded. And Christ looks a fool in the eyes of the world because of that. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and he said, I am going to speak to you like a fool. And then he proceeded to boast of all his worldly accomplishments, constantly reiterating, understand I'm speaking to you like a fool, so that he could make a point. Permit me in this moment to speak to you for a second like a fool and not as your pastor. Here is Neil's opinion on COVID. Not your pastor's opinion, just some guy. I don't really care about it anymore. Okay? That's my opinion. I'm unimpressed. Most of us have had it. It seems to, by now, have turned into something relatively mild. And uh, I had H1N1. It was a lot worse than, uh, than COVID is now. I know that people are dying of COVID. I don't trivialize that. I think it's important that we should stay safe and keep those who are vulnerable safe. I even know that some people who don't appear to be vulnerable still die from it. I just happen to agree with our Premier Higgs that it seems like we're all going to get it because <laughs> it's going around. And I think we should try and get on with our lives and not live in fear and strive to live for God. Now, what I just did there is I told you Neil's personal opinion on COVID. And if that made you respect me more as a pastor, you need to check your heart. Because that has absolutely nothing to do with the gospel of Christ. And if that made you angry with me, then you need to check your heart. Because that has nothing to do with the gospel of Christ. We are not bound together because of any worldly thing or any worldly conviction. I didn't tell you that because I think you ought to agree with me. I, I didn't tell you that because I think it belongs in the pulpit. I tell you that only to make a point that our hearts readily get roused, just as if I were to tell you something about supporting a political party, having a view about environmentalism, having a particular perspective on any worldly thing, and that were to create a wall of division between us, that means there is something wrong in our hearts. Our unity does not come from these external things. I don't care if you agree with me. I love you as a brother. <laughs> That's just nothing. Nothing. 
It's trivial. It's nonsense. And we must put it there, outside. Do you understand something? The slaves in Rome were never once in Scripture given any encouragement to fight for their own freedom or the freedom of their own children. That's kind of significant. The scriptural counsel for the slaves in Rome was, <laughs> if you are free, do not become a slave if you can avoid it. If you are a slave and you have the ability to become free, then become free. Otherwise, serve as a slave faithfully as unto Christ. Is it not significant to you that slaves whose children would then become slaves were not in any one place in Scripture given even a, <laughs> an impression that they had the right or that it was right or that it was good for them to do any unlawful thing to free themselves or their children from slavery? And yet we, so readily, for the sake of our own prosperity, for the sake of what we deem to be best for us in the world, to be best for our freedom, our safety, our security, our prosperity, will readily hate other people or champion them even though they happen to be enemies of the gospel. Nonsense! We are fighting together for the gospel of Christ. And if we happen to disagree on matters of COVID or inflation or, you know, whether or not a certain war or policy or government style is great, you know what? If you disagree with me, then laugh, roll your eyes, and let's face forward and fight the enemy together because those things don't matter. We are called to be a part of the body whose head is Christ. It is not Neil. Do not conform yourself to what Neil thinks is the right way to live in this world. Conform yourself to what the gospel tells you you are to do to live in love of God and one another and the world. That is our calling. Nothing else matters. Apply the scriptures. You have absolute freedom to eat or not eat, drink or not drink, observe a day as holy or disregard it, to, in matters of conscience, be obedient to your conscience, in living out what is given to us clearly in Scripture as the means of walking in holiness. Do that in submission to one another. Fight together against our own sin, against the enemies of the gospel in the world that we might save them against false teaching that would lead people away from salvation, and absolutely against Satan who wants to divide us on these stupid, trivial, worldly things. Let us fight against him and stand firm together that we may disagree on everything else because we are brothers in Christ. That's it, and that's the end of it. The foundation has to be right, guys. For you and for me, we need to understand that this church belongs to Christ and we as members of it, whether in full submission to everything that is taught here or not, are to serve one another in God in love and humility, knowing that our enemy is not each other, but it is out there. And we are to stand firm together. We are to fight in perfect unity together, like choreographed, <laughs> choreographed, uh, synchronized swimmers or something, <laughs> knowing exactly what each other is ought to be doing at any, any given point, serving one another with the gifts that God has given to us, and let us work for the gospel of Christ. This is what it means to belong to the church. And if you are not in the church through faith, there is only one means of being united to Christ, and it is through the bond of the Holy Spirit. It is received according to your repentance, acknowledging your need of healing from your sin, 
acknowledging the burden that you carry of having wounded others, sinned against others, sinned against yourself, and fallen short of what God deserves of you, and giving in prayer a repentance and a humbling of yourself, asking him to be your Lord. And if you have done that and received the Holy Spirit, you will be joined to the body of Christ and able to serve and able to use your gifts to the service of that and enabled to stand firm against the enemy and to fight together with us against that enemy. So let us exalt Christ in ourselves by being bound together in that service. Father, we do exalt your name. We lift you up. We ask that you would glorify yourselves in our midst by calling us to be in unity in our efforts to stand firm against the powers of darkness, to never be divided on any worldly thing, to never let these things which Paul would rightly describe as folly, as worldly things, worldly estimations of wisdom or accomplishment, to be the thing that we serve, but let your name be the thing that we serve. Let us never attack one another for the sake of our convictions, knowing, Father, that we are not to be turned against the spirit that lives in any man. Teach us to love one another, even in the way that we remove the ticks and the leeches of this world, of our own desires from one another. Teach us, Father, to be humble and submissive to one another, to be willing to hear correction, to be willing to stand firm with those about whom we disagree on any worldly matter, and to love one another and to serve you. And may your name be exalted in our presence. Let us never fail in the manner that we would trust in the teachings of man, that we would be united under any other banner than Christ's name alone. We ask this, Lord, to to the end that we might participate in those works which you have prepared beforehand for us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I think I've gone over, guys. Let's uh, let's call it. And uh, I might just invite, oh, my brother Case to uh, give us a final prayer and we will go in peace. <clears throat>